Hello and welcome to Walker Awards Podcast. My name's Rachel and this is the podcast where we step behind the veil to take a look at some long lost and little known urban legends and spooky stories. Yorkshire is a stunning county in the north east of England. With beautiful scenery and spadefuls of history, Yorkshire and the county seat York are nearly always featured on travel lists. Nicknamed God's Own Country because of the sheer beauty of the area, Yorkshire contains a fair few of the country's national parks and areas of outstanding beauty, including the North York Moors, the Yorkshire Dales, part of the North Pennines and the Yorkshire Wolds. And it's the Wolds that we're going to be visiting today, courtesy of acclaimed author Charles Christian and his book The Mysterious Wold Newton Triangle. Now, for some reason, my brain always auto-corrects the title, The Mysterious Newton Wall Triangle. And Charles has been exceptionally patient in dealing with my strange brain. So I, if I accidentally call it the Newton Wall Triangle, please note it's actually the Wald Newton Triangle. And after that little announcement, let's get into today's spooky stories. There are many triangles across the world. Most people know the stories of the Bermuda Triangle, a place where planes and ships mysteriously disappear. The same goes for the Nevada Triangle, which is a space of land where aircraft and their pilots disappear. But across the globe are a number of triangles where downright downright strange stuff happens. Notably, and one that I need to do a podcast on, is the Bridgewater Triangle in Massachusetts. There's a fantastic film about the area, which, when I last checked, was free to watch on YouTube and is simply titled The Bridgewater Triangle. The Wald Newton Triangle is pretty much the same. An area along the eastern side of the UK which has some strange and interesting happenings within its boundaries. The triangle stretches from Scarborough in the north to Flamborough Head in the southeast before finally turning back on itself and heading towards Burton Agnes. The Yorkshire Wolds are low hills which eventually slope off into the North Sea. Our first stop is Flamborough Head. Flamborough Head is a promontory eight miles long on the Yorkshire coast of England between the Filey and Bridlington Bays of the North Sea. It is chalk headland with sheer white cliffs. The cliff top has two standing lighthouse towers, the oldest dating from 1669 and Flamborough Head Lighthouse built in 1806. The older lighthouse was designated a Grade 2 listed building in 1952 and is now recorded in the National Heritage List for England, maintained by Historic England. The cliffs provide nesting sites for many thousands of seabirds and are of international significance for their geology. Flamborough Head also had not one but three ghosts haunting the area. A spectral white lady is said to haunt Danes Dyke and two female wraiths walk the streets of Flamborough Village. One of them goes by the name of Jenny Gallows and wears an old-fashioned poke bonnet on her head while the other possesses neither a bonnet nor a head. Jenny Gallows is said to be the ghost of a young woman who, during the early years of the 19th century, committed suicide by throwing herself into a circular pit and drowning herself. According to local legend, if you run around the pit nine times, you will hear the sound of fairies. Unfortunately, when you complete the eighth circuit of the pit, the ghost of Jenny Gallows will rise from the pit and cry out in a broad Yorkshire accent, which I'm not going to attempt, I'll tie on my bonnet, I'll put on my shoe, and if thou's not off, I'll soon catch you. Needless to say, one evening, back in the late 19th century, a local farmer, who probably had a fair bit to drink, decided to put this legend to the test, but rather than run around the pit, he rode around it on his horse, a bay mare. And luckily for him and his horse, on the 8th circuit, Jenny emerged from the pit and chased him all the way back to the village, nearly catching him and at one point getting close enough to bite the mare's flank, which left a white patch that never faded, but remained there until the horse's dying day. Our next stop through the Yorkshire Wolds is Flixton, a village approximately eight miles south of Scarborough. Flixton has a couple of guest houses and a pub called the Foxhound Inn. Archaeological excavations in the area have revealed items dating back at least 10,000 years. Flixton has something that is rarely seen in the UK, a werewolf. So back to you, Charles, for the tale of the werewolf of Flixton. England has plenty of tales of large, ghostly black dogs, such as Black Shuck, the hellhound that terrorised parts of East Anglia in the 16th century, but almost no werewolves. This is in sharp contrast to the rest of Eastern and Western Europe, where such tales abound. They were first to be found during classical antiquity in the literature of ancient Greece and Rome. They can be found in later Slavic and Germanic folklore, as well as in Scandinavia and in the Balkans. 
By the 16th century, there were even alleged werewolves being put on trial, along with witches and sorcerers in courts in parts of what are now France and Germany. One of the few historical exceptions to the no werewolves please with British rule is to be found haunting the roads among, around the villages of Flixton and Folkton, which we visited in the first chapter of the book. This cre- creature, usually called Old Stinker, because of the terrible stench of its breath, is described as having large red eyes that glow in the dark. They're sometimes mistaken by passing motorists for being the rear lights of another car. There's even a report during the 1960s of a lorry whose driver had slowed down at the sight of the two glowing red lights being attacked by a huge wolf-like creature that tried unsuccessfully to smash its way through the windshield. When I was a teenager growing up in nearby Scarborough, the local legend I was familiar with said Old Stinker returned at dawn to sleep beneath a tomb in the churchyard of St John the Evangelist in Folkton. Fans of supernatural fiction will recognise that the M.R. James ghost story, an episode of Cathedral History, has a similar theme of a monster of the night returning to a church tomb with the start of a new day. So where did the legend spring from? For an explanation, we need to go back to where we started this book, with the hostel at Spittle Hoe. According to the 16th century historian William Camden, Although Lord Ackholm's Hospital at Spittle Ho was built to shelter wayfarers in wintertime from attacks by wolves, in times of severe weather, these creatures were regarded with particular loathing because they scavenged in graveyards for freshly buried corpses. These wolves' apparent cunning in discovering unprotected cattle, their boldness in attacking travellers, and their habit of suddenly descending in large packs on areas where they had previously been unknown gave rise to the belief that they were not ordinary wolves but human beings who changed into a wolf-like creature by night. During late Saxon times, there was even a suggestion these creatures were controlled by a sorcerer whose normal appearance enabled him to gather information about cattle, sheep and human wayfarers in taverns and markets. A variation of this tale said the sorcerer was, in true werewolf movie style, a shapeshifter himself who lived in the area by day in human form before turning into a wolf at night to seize his victims. Perhaps the sorcerer was Old Stinker himself, the occupant of the tomb in the Folkton churchyard. After these initial reports of werewolf activity in Saxon times, there is an account two centuries later, around 1150, of a large wolf prowling the area and taking and eating a local shepherd and a young girl, as well as a few farm animals. Although wolf-like in appearance, this creature is described as walking upright and having a particularly long and powerful tail, almost as long as its body, that it used to knock its victims to the floor. It is also about this time we hear the first reports of the creature's ferocious red eyes, crimson and darting fire, and foul breath. Over the next few hundred years, the werewolf disappears from the historical record only to reappear during the closing years of the 18th century, when a huge wolf-like creature attacked a coach travelling along the York Road near Flixton. The wolf fled after being shot by one of the occupants and was not heard of again until encountered by our lorry driver in the 1960s. So, could there have been a werewolf haunting this area of Yorkshire over a thousand years ago? Or is there a far more natural, less paranormal explanation? For people living in those pre-scientific times, lacking our knowledge of animal behaviour, as well as the physiology and characteristics of wolves, in particular their powerful sense of smell, night vision capabilities, and the way they can work as a team when working in packs, the hunting skills of wolves might have seemed nothing short of miraculous, and something that could only be attributed to supernatural forces. Adding the behaviour of wolves in winter when they would have come down off the bleak uplands of the wolds and into the valley of Pickering to scavenge the bodies of the dead in their newly dug graves, and you can understand why they would have been feared as demonic, unnatural monsters. Then there was the practice of Viking berserker warriors, dressing in the skins of bears and wolves, before going into battle. Could they have provided the factual basis for aspects of the legend of werewolves as possessed and apparently unstoppable killing machines? It is particularly noteworthy that in 1066, a Viking army, the last one to try and invade England, passed through this part of Yorkshire after burning the town of Scarborough to the ground and before meeting the Saxons at the Battle of Stamford Bridge. 
Leading the Vikings was King Harald of Norway, who would subsequently be killed at Stamford Bridge, fighting in a trance-like state of berserker gang, while wearing no body armour and swinging a two-handed sword. Imagine yourself in the place of an 11th century peasant or merchant and here you have just fled for your life from the carnage of Scarborough. You are familiar with the tales of the horror wrecked by the predatory wolves that stalk this area and now, cowering for shelter in the gloom of a barn, you watch as an army of blood-splattered, half-naked Vikings dressed in the skins of bears and wolves march past. Are they really humans or are they half-wolf and half-men? Werewolves, in fact. Perhaps over the centuries, folk memories of real wolves became merged with the tales of Viking warriors and thus from natural and historical origins, the legend of Old Stinker, the werewolf Flixton, was born. But that was almost 1,000 years ago. And apart from a couple of sightings, it has been very quiet since then. So has Old Stinker crumbled away to dust? When I wrote the first edition of this book, I certainly believe so. Then in late 2015... Life began to imitate art and Old Stinker returned from the undead. So the story of Old Stinker hasn't yet ended. As with all good stories, Old Stinker got his sequel greenlit in 2016 when Charles received a phone call from a journalist working with a British newspaper group asking his opinion on the werewolf sightings in Hull. These werewolf sightings took place around 2016-2017. Flixton, the village which laid claim to the original sightings, is only 35 miles, give or take, from Hull. Charles's response was that Old Stinker had decided to move on to pastures new. Many news outlets ended up carrying this story, and this is what the Huffington Post had to say about Old Stinker in May 2016. An eight-foot-tall, hairy creature which can stand upright like a man is said to be prowling a derelict industrial area just outside of Hull. One eyewitness claims to have seen the half-man, half-dog lurking around the banks of Barmston Drain at Christmas and since then there have been six further reported sightings. A woman told the Daily Express, It was stood upright one moment, the next it was down on all fours and running like a dog. I was terrified. It bounded along on all fours, then stopped and reared up onto its back legs before running down the embankment towards the water. It vaulted 30 feet over to the other side and vanished up the embankment and over a wall into some allotments. Another person told the Hull Daily Mail they had seen something tall and hairy jump over an eight-foot fence, carrying a German shepherd in its jaws. The sightings have been linked to the local legend of a werewolf called Old Stinker, described by author Charles Christian as a great hairy beast with red eyes who was so called because he had bad breath. The legend was born because that part of the country was once infested with wolves, Christian explains, pointing out that up until the 18th century, there was still a bounty for anyone killing them. It was known for the wolves to dig up the corpses from graveyards. From that sprung the idea that they were supernatural beings who took the form of werewolves, he told the Hall Daily Mail. Paranormal investigator Lee Brickley told Huffington Post, it's a case I'm following closely and it certainly raises many issues relating to the existence of werewolves in the UK. Brickley, who is the author of UFOs, Werewolves and the Pigman, added, As most people are aware, my home turf, Canic Chase, is renowned for such encounters, and I'd most definitely like to investigate this case further. It appears yet again that there are many similarities within the sighting reports, and so I wouldn't rule this out as being a genuine paranormal encounter. Whether people believe werewolves are flesh and blood creatures or just beastly apparitions is another matter entirely. But despite the evidence, Charles is sceptical that Old Stinker is back on the prowl. Speaking to Huffington Post UK, he said the animal is more likely to be some feral creature living there that has just got large and shaggy, like a big dog. Musing that it is likely to be a large breed that has been let go by owners who can no longer care for it, Christian guesses that it could be a Japanese Akita or Husky. There has been a fashion for huskies as pets and they grow enormous. The area where this animal is being sighted is semi-derelict and filled with abandoned warehouses and factories. An ideal shelter for it, he said. Christian, who is the author of A Travel Guide to Yorkshire's Wild Worlds, added, I wouldn't advise stocking up on silver bullets just yet, but I would advise against going out into the area by yourself without a big stick. Nonetheless, Hull historian Mike Covell has organised a nighttime werewolf hunt during the next full moon. 
Cove will set the idea is to visit the drain and walk along it armed with the recording equipment. It has attracted a lot of interest and although people are taking it with a pinch of salt, they are fascinated by the reports. The werewolf hunt went ahead in May 2016 and as a member of the Daily Express's newly appointed crack team of paranormal investigators, Charles went along to try and track down old Stinker. Here's his account of that moonlit night back in 2016. In the circumstances, it therefore should not have come to, should not have come as a surprise to me when the Sunday Express invited me to join their crack team of paranormal investigators on a werewolf hunt in Hull on the night of the next full moon. The team comprised of newspaper journalist Mark Brannigan, local historian Mike Covell, along with myself and my wife Jane, who had been dubbed the animal behaviourist of our team. And that is how I find myself at 11pm on the night of the 21st of May in an abandoned and distinctly spooky precincts of St Mary's Graveyard in the district of Hull, standing by a tombstone posing for press photographs. Although the St Mary's Graveyard had in recent months been the scene of both an attempted murder and the illicit filming of a porn movie featuring a black mass, our team did not see or hear anything usual. Unusual. We therefore moved on to the location of one of the reported old stinker sightings. This was the pathway running along the side of the Beverly and Barmston drain. The drain is a 200 year old drainage canal and one time channel that flows across 25 miles of open countryside from Dreffield and Beverly before cutting through Hull and eventually emptying into the River Humber. The frequent sightings of our were- werewolf dating back to December 2015 along the banks of the drain had resulted in the creature locally earning the nickname of the Beast of Barmston Drain. The cynics among you will have noted that December in normal years is the Christmas party season, a season of goodwill to all and excessive consumption of alcohol by one and all. There is, however, a further twist in the timings of the first sighting, which I will reveal in the final section of this chapter. The sightings included one couple who reported seeing something tall and hairy eating a German shepherd dog by the side of the drain. They said they stopped to take a closer look, then saw it jump over an eight-foot high fence and vanish into the night, still carrying its prey. Another witness said she'd seen the beast running on all fours before standing tall on its hind legs. It then bounded down the embankment and jumped the drain before it vaulted over to the other side and vanished up the embankment and over a wall in some allotments. And yet another person described a terrifying encounter with an eight foot tall half man half dog creature. She added that her dog, which she was walking at the time, began shaking in fear and would not go any further. Certainly the banks of the Barmston drain did have a creepy atmosphere, especially late at night. In parts they were overgrown with saplings and briar, providing plenty of cover for any wildlife in there. The drain itself runs through derelict factory and industrial sites as well as along the edge of two graveyards. The Barmston drain also has a macabre reputation thanks to two centuries of accidental drownings at a rate average averaging one death a year, of mainly young children swimming in the warm but heavily polluted water, as well as a few intentional murders and suicides. There are even newspaper reports dating back to the early 1830s of young children having been dreadfully bitten by vicious dogs seen prowling close to the drain. And pervading all of this was the sickly sweet stench of decay emanating from an old leather tanning works still operated by the side of the drain. But what did our intrepid team see that night? The first unusual thing I spotted, that on the western side of the drain there was a steep bank lying parallel to the footpath alongside the edge of the drain. Although the bank was overgrown with saplings and briar, I could see that parts of the vegetation had been crushed and broken underfoot, as if something large and heavy had been trampling or rolling down it. The damage was far more extensive than you'd expect from the usual wild animals, such as rabbits, dogs and even foxes you now encounter in urban areas. My first reaction was someone had rolled a boulder or cinder block, refuse wheelie bin or a supermarket trolley down the bank to cause this amount of damage, but there was no visible traces of what may have caused it. Besides, there was at least half a dozen of these tracks and dragging whatever it was to the top of the bank would have probably required more effort than most mischievous kids or vandals could bother with. It is also possible that kids riding mountain bikes or motorised trail bikes could have caused the amount of damage but as there was only a relatively narrow path lying between the embankment and the steep banks of the Barmston drain, there would have been a very real risk that both the rider and bike would have crashed straight down into the murky waters of the drain. There have been no reports of any such accidents besides 
which there had been no si signs of the skid marks, were running down to the water's edge that it would have inevitably accompanied that kind of crash. The only conclusion I could draw was that the tracks had been caused by a very large animal. Sadly, our hunt took place at the close of a couple of weeks of dry weather, when the ground had turned rock hard, so there was no discernible animal tracks which we could observe that night. I'm not going to give away the ending of Charles's tale, and whether or not he found the newly christened beast of Balmston Drain, because you can find it in his book. So the mysterious Wald Newton Triangle has a plethora of such stories. Stories which rival even Canic Chase, which I did an episode on a few months ago. Like so many places in the UK and around the area, this around the world, sorry, this tiny area of God's own country is filled with the weird, wonderful, and otherwise unexplainable. I'm going to try and get Charles on here at some point to tell some of these stories because they are just incredible. If you'd like to find out what else haunts those beautiful rolling hills, please do feel free to check out the mysterious Wald Newton Triangle on Amazon and at all good bookshops. Until next time, stay spooky. Thank you.